it is just after 11 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our first RD Updates episode of 2021. And I'm personally very excited to kick off this first episode with Dr. Holly Wyatt joining us. And I will let Beth Kitchen introduce Dr. Holly in just a moment. But first, I just wanted to cover a couple of quick housekeeping items for you all. Um, The first is I'm going to keep periodically typing into the chat box the uh, survey that you can complete to get your CPEU for attending if you're a registered dietitian on the call. I apologize that you'll see me pop it in a few times, but you don't see what's in the chat until you join the meeting. So I'm just going to keep adding it to make sure that everyone gets the link to complete this. And speaking of the chat box, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat throughout the segment. We love for this to be interactive. So if you have a question as Dr. Holly is covering any specific content, I'll interject and ask that that question for you in the middle of the segment. So again, please feel free to type things into the chat box as we go along. All right, with that, Beth, I'll let you go ahead and introduce Dr. Holly. Thank you so much, Tara. Welcome everyone to the first RD updates of the year. We're really excited to have Dr. Holly Wyatt. She is known as Dr. Holly, uh, and she's an endocrinologist and a weight loss and maintenance expert. She does both research and clinical work, so she really knows what she's talking about. You might know her from seasons four and five of the ABC TV show Extreme Weight Loss, so she's kind of a celebrity around here. Um, She's originally from Texas, where she got her undergraduate degree in microbiology at UT Austin. She got her medical degree at Baylor. And then from Texas, she went on to the University of Colorado. And now she splits her time between Colorado and Birmingham. Here in our department, the UAB Department of Nutrition Sciences, she's the vice chair for clinical programs. She's also the director of the State of SLIM program and the co-author of the book by the same name. So please welcome Dr. Holly. I think you're really going to enjoy all that she has to share with us today. Dr. Holly, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, this is, this is fun. Yeah, I'm so excited about you being here. You have so much to offer. I, I wanna start off by asking you to, to give us a little background. Tell us about your journey, both personal and professional. Yeah, this is your calling. Uh, and so tell us about how, how you got here. Yeah, well, you know, I have always just loved body weight regulation, metabolism. When I was a teenager in high school, I personally knew something was wrong with my metabolism. You know, what I had to do to stay fit and stay at a healthy body weight seemed so different than my friends. And I would watch them eating junk food and know I couldn't do it. Or I would gain weight and I was on the dance squad and that was super important to me. So I was constantly trying to look, think about my nutrition and my physical activity and what I had to do just seemed so different. Um, I was like, something's wrong with me. And so I was really interested in that metabolism piece. And fast forward, I got, I was always going to be a doctor, got into medical school and found out that I actually could study this, that I could actually, this could be part of my career. And I love that, right? When you can do something that you're passionate about. And that's just a win-win and became an endocrinologist so that I could study body weight regulation, study weight loss, study obesity, and was able to develop programs to help people, which was kind of the other piece of it. So kind of a personal passion. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years. So, you know, a long time, even kind of before it was cool. I always say I was uh, helping people lose weight before it was cool to help people lose weight. Um, before we really talked about it very much. Um, so this has been my whole career it has been around why do people struggle with weight loss? Why do they struggle keeping the weight off and not regaining it? Um, why are people different? And then how do we take that and help more people live at a healthier body weight? That's really been my passion. And that's, I've just been really blessed that I was able to kind of marry the two, my passion and my, my job, what I do every day. So that so, yeah, so it really came from a personal place that now you're able to share and and help a lot of other people. Um, tell us, you you basically said you've been doing this a long time for for over 20, 25 years. W- what have you learned over the years, and particularly what about 
you know, the obesity gene that we hear so much about. Is there an obesity gene? And, and you know, as you say right here, are we doomed to be obese if we do have the obesity gene, if there is a single obesity gene? Yeah. So this is a question I think a lot about because if I'm out there trying to help people lose weight, it's a, it's a lost cause, right? Am, am I wasting my time? And there are people who kind of feel that way. They feel like, you know what, Holly? Um, it's really hard to help people lose weight and keep it off. And perhaps we should just let people gain weight and just treat the comorbidities, just treat their glucose and their insulin resistance and their cancer and their cardiovascular disease and their high cholesterol. And that's what we should concentrate on and just allow, you know, we're gaining weight and there's nothing we can do about it. Let's just treat the consequences of weight gain or gaining body fat. But I just don't believe that's the truth. I believe we can intervene. I believe we aren't doomed to be obese. I think we have a long ways to go and there's lots of interesting pieces of this puzzle we haven't figured out. But I honestly believe that we are not doomed to be obese, that we can figure it out. And one of the big kind of learnings that I like to start out with, with, with whenever I, I give a, a talk or I talk to people is we've got to get away from this idea that there's only one reason why we're obese. I think that's one of the reasons why we struggle so much is everybody has their favorite thing and everybody thinks it's one thing and it's not. I think there's multiple things that are really leading us to gain weight or leading us into this obesity um, epidemic. And we need to start thinking about it differently if we're gonna have a different solution that's gonna move the needle for us. And yeah, and you know, I think um, that's really interesting that you say that because I hear that a lot, especially with researchers, if they're studying the microbiome, it's all about the microbiome, or if they're studying insulin sensitivity, it's all about that. And there are all these multiple things that play a role. There's not even one gene, as you said, it's, it's lots of different genes that might predispose us to be, to have a weight problem. Um, what, what other environmental things come into play? Um, so, you know, it's multiple genes, the environment plays a role. So what are all of these multiple causes that can contribute to our weight gain? Yeah. So I like to think of that as kind of a lock and a key that genes are absolutely important and they kind of um, prescribe a physiology that makes it more likely that you're gonna gain weight or produce an obesity type phenotype. And definitely some of us have those genes and some of us don't. And there is definitely is a metabolism and physiological and genetic predisposition, no doubt. But that's not the only piece of the story. There's also the environment and you really need both pieces to actually gain weight. And when you take the right set of genes and you put them in an obesogenic environment, which means an environment that really predisposes you to not move more, to move little, you know, to, to, to not move at all, basically, and an environment that causes us to eat more food than we probably need, it's really, then you start to see um, obesity and you start to see it increasing in the population. So the reason why this is important is we now know we have a population that has a genetic predisposition, more than half of the population has a genetic predisposition. We have an environment that causes obesity and you put the two together, we have this obesity you know, epidemic. And when we treat it though, we need to think both about the physiology and the environment because both are playing a role. It's not one or the other, it's both. Love this slide, um, Beth, and think it's gonna get at your kind of gene question that you asked me, so I didn't forget it. Um, the idea that genes are important. And these are the Pima Indians. And a lot of you are familiar probably with a lot of the studies that revolve around the Pima Indians, a very, uh, a group of individuals that have a lot of genes that predispose them to gain weight and to obesity. And if you look at this slide, it shows that both genes and environment are super important. And you can see with the blue, um, the blue bar, this is when the Pima Indians lived in Mexico. So they didn't live in an environment that really predisposed them to obesity. They lived in an environment where they had to do a lot of physical activity to survive, to get through their day. And they lived in an environment where food wasn't as plentiful. They had, you have to kind of work for your food. It just wasn't there all the time. And if you look, their average body mass index, even in this environment where most of us would actually be very, very lean, was 25 are even higher, right? So wow, they did have this thrifty genetic kind of physiology going on. 
move them, transport them, they move into the United States, into Arizona, which is a very obesogenic environment, meaning they don't have to walk and, and do as much lifestyle activity and food is more plentiful and easy and high, you know, energy dense. And look what happens to their body mass index. It goes up. So the genes stayed the same, the environment changed, but this slide shows both the importance of the genes, setting them up, right? Even in a non-environment where most people would have a BMI of 20, they had a BMI of 25, and then move them to an environment like we have right now in the United States, and it even gets worse. They, they gain weight. And I always love this slide to make one more point. Everybody talks about a set point, especially when it comes to why people can't lose weight. And they're like, oh, it's a set point. Huh, this shows that it's not a set point. This is a settling point. It changed. They weren't wired to be one weight. They can change their weight. And their environment is a really big factor in that. And then one more, one more slide just to hammer home this point is there's not just one gene. Mm -hmm. I know we are talking about the obesity gene. Oh my gosh. There are multiple genes that are being identified every day. You probably have certain people have a certain number of them. Some of them may be more impactful than others. Certain genes may react in a certain environment more. So you may have certain genes that really, if you're sedentary, may really show themselves. We don't understand that. Um, we have, you know, we have these tests out there where people sometimes buy that kind of give them a profile, but we do not know how to take this and really implement it. But we do know the more genes you have, this slide shows that your body weight increases. So just showing that genetics are playing a big role. And this slide, this is right up your alley, Beth. This is showing that <laughs> environment, all the things that you talk about a lot, all the things that we can push back against. You can't change your genes, but all these environmental things are things we can potentially work with to, uh, to help people lose weight. Yeah. And, and it's not one thing, but I always hear, you know, I, not everybody, but I often hear people, whether it's a researcher or somebody who's selling a book, it's like, here's the thing that is going to fix everything. And it just doesn't work that way. I mean, look at all of these causes. And so you can, as you always say, you, you know, you can pick whatever reason, but we have to attack this from many, many different, many different avenues. There are some people that say, oh, if we just got rid of sugar, it would fix it all. You know, if we just, um, you know, got rid of sedentary workplaces, it would fix it all. But as you say here, no. Yeah, we like that. So we like to blame one thing. It makes us feel good, right? This is the reason. And if we go after this reason, we're going to solve our problem. Or we really like it if it's something that's been hidden, it's been a secret or something that's been done to us, right? That's even better, right? We can really get behind that. And I'm not saying that there haven't been things that have happened that have contributed. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of things, right? And this is what this, 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 uh, this slide shows is this graphic shows is that we can make a long, 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 long list. And I can say yes to every single one of them. And so we tend to, like you say, blame one thing. We get really into the fact that there's, you know, two, the schools have really changed and every, you know, there's no recess or activity in the schools or that, you know, there is a, an economic reason why we choose certain foods. And we become so fixated on that. We lose track of all these other things. And I think to move the needle, the reason why this is so important is to move the needle. We're going to have to deal with all this. We're not going to be able to pick one or two to be able to really move the needle and start reversing this obesity epidemic that we're seeing. And even our friends, we've always, I, I, I remember when this headline came out several years ago, obesity is contagious. Now, of course, they didn't mean contagious like an infectious disease, but the people that we are around, the people that we socialize with, our friends and our families can have a pretty big influence on our weight. Yeah, I love this you know, topic because people don't really realize this. They don't understand that, yeah, the people you hang out with, your social environment, we talk about our physical environment a lot, but our social environment, the people we rub elbows with, the people you spend time with in person or virtual, so it could be virtual rub elbow, doesn't have to be, you take on their behavior. And if you start taking on the behaviors and thinking that's the normative behavior, it can have an impact on your weight. And there's lots of good research to show that. You know, if the normative thing, if all your friends go out to happy hours or 
are eating a certain way, you're more likely to eat that way than if you're hanging out with people that are going to farmer's markets and tend to be eating vegetables, you're more likely to eat a vegetable. Same thing for physical activity. I think this is one of the biggest reasons why Colorado is the leanest state is we have this kind of impact of social environment that kind of contributes to behavior. But I love this. I love looking at it and thinking about it. Who do I hang out with? And how am I influencing people? And how are people influencing me? Because it goes both ways. Yeah, it's so interesting that you came from Colorado, one of the leanest states, to Alabama, who had that a state that has one of the biggest problems with weight. So that's that's kind of kind of interesting. You kind of went from from one extreme to the other there. Now, speaking for as dietitians, I think most of us, even though I don't work in weight loss now, I did many years ago, and I think all of us have experienced, or many of us, let me say, have worked with helping people to lose weight, which is very difficult. Um, and But a lot of people actually do lose weight only to have it come back. And that to me is very frustrating for people. I think it takes an emotional and psychological toll on people where they've lost weight and then they gain it back and sort of that, that, that whole yo-yo thing. What are we missing here? Why, uh, why are we you know, not so bad at weight loss. I wouldn't say we're great at it, but we can sometimes achieve that, but we're not so, not so great at helping people with, with keeping it off. Yeah, this is my, my the second point I always like to make. You know, the first one is there's lots of reasons. We got to think of them all. But the second point, and really to me, one of the big reasons why people fail, and when I say fail, I mean regain the weight, um, is I don't think we, we need to be thinking about it a little bit differently. We need to have a little paradigm shift. We need to think about weight loss as being something that's different from weight loss maintenance. I think a lot of times, initially, we used to think about weight loss as being something short term. You got the weight off and then you could just walk away. Well, we know that's not the case now. That we, we, we changed our paradigm. We started thinking about it differently. We thought, okay, it's chronic. Whatever you do to lose the weight, you got to keep doing it. It's, it's like you know, anything. If you take away whatever you were doing, you're going to go back. It's not, it's not cured. It's, some, it's treated. And it's a chronic condition like high blood pressure or diabetes that needs chronic treatment. So we move there. And I think the next kind of shift that we have to have if we want to move the needle and help people be successful is we've got to think about weight loss as a different entity. And it therefore requires a different strategy than weight loss maintenance. Not just you start losing weight and then you stop losing and you just go on forever, that you lose weight for a finite period of time. You do it with different strategies. Then you move, you actually shift and you start maintaining a weight loss and you use different strategies. The things that work best for weight loss are not the things that work best for weight loss maintenance. And if you think about it, they're very, very different. They're different physiologically. So it would make sense that the strategies are different. You know, to be in weight loss, you've got to be in a negative energy balance. You have to be eating less calories than you're burning. By definition, there's no other way. It, it, you can get there with a bunch of different diets or different strategies. But ultimately, to burn fat, you've got to eat less calories um, than you burn, than you expend. And that's a different physiological process than being in weight loss maintenance where you don't need to be in a negative energy balance. You need to be in balance. You need how many calories you're burning to match. And if you eat a little bit more, you want to burn a little bit more. And if you eat a little bit less, you want to burn a little bit less. Then you want that matching to occur. Very different than pulling apart how many calories I'm expending and how many calories I'm eating. And the further I pull it apart, the more weight loss I get. Very different. Different, your body sees it as different and different strategies. And so classically, we think about weight loss as usually for most people, if you look at the data, they can lose weight for four to six months and then they start to plateau. Most yeah. of the study. Um, so you need to think of it as kind of finite and how you, the body can be put in that negative energy balance, the strategies that work for that. And the body won't let it happen forever. If right. you have a negative balance, a negative energy balance forever, you would die right? You would, you would waste away and die. Your body's not going to let you do that. That makes a lot of sense. So there's almost like this, this window of opportunity for weight loss. That's about four to six months. And, you know, we hear this a lot that, you know, exercise doesn't really help that much with actual weight loss, that you've really got to change the diet there. 
And we're, and, you know, we're going to, of course, touch on, on where exercise comes into all this. And it's not that exercise isn't still important during weight loss for overall health, but the diet is really what, what needs to change. Yeah. So that kind of leads right, right into this. And the idea is that you, when you think about weight loss, when you're prescribing weight loss, when you're counseling, when you're helping your, your, your patients with weight loss, nutrition is driving the bus. Now, like you said, there's a lot of people in the bus. Physical activity is in the bus. Mindset's in the bus. Routines and rituals are in the bus. Lots of people in the bus. But if you don't have a driver, you're not going anywhere. And the driver of the bus that has to be there, along with other people, but they have to have the driver is nutrition. Because nutrition is going to do the heavy lifting and producing the negative energy balance. So if you are helping someone lose weight, there needs to be a nutritional component. Um, I don't believe there's just one, and we'll talk about that in a minute but you've got to have some type of nutritional structure, some way that you're going to decrease the calories. And this is one of my favorite, all time favorite kind of data slides. It's very old study, but it just hammers this point home. And if you see the BC, um, the balanced caloric deficit diet versus this is a protein sparing modified fast, I think for two different nutritional plans. But if you look at the eight weeks, so we're looking at weight loss. Don't, don't look at the 18 months that yet. That's weight loss maintenance. So just look at the purple bars, the eight weeks representing weight loss. There's a little bit of additional weight loss if you add exercise, but not much. Nutrition, the diet is doing the heavy lifting. The diet has to be there. And yes, you can add on and make it a little bit better. And for other reasons, we always want to use that multi, you know, we want to use other things with the diet, but the nutrition has to be there. And you can see the nutrition doing the heavy lifting in this slide. And that, you know, that leads me to my next question. We argue so much about the perfect diet. Should it be low carb? Should it be low fat? You know, and this is, you know, and then you've got your, you know, uh, sort of the celebrity doctors that are up here, like arguing about this in, in uh, the stratosphere. And it gets pretty heated. If you go on Twitter and look at some of the people that argue about this, it's like, whoa, they get pretty passionate about this. And um, so, you know, what, what diet is, or is there a perfect diet? And I think Tara has a question. So I'm going to, um, if, if you don't mind, let's pause here. Cause we got a, an audience question that I'd like to, to, to have Tara talk to us about. Yes. Thank you, Beth, for noticing that. Uh, we have a question from the audience about Dr. Holly, what do you suggest for bariatric patients? So patients who are following an appropriate diet and participating in physical activity whose weight loss journey continues past that window of weight loss that you mentioned. Yeah, so bariatric um, patients are a little bit different because you're right, the weight loss does continue long-term. When you make a permanent um, you know, change in the physiology, we do see a longer tail in terms of the weight loss, but I will tell you, they will stop losing weight at some point. Just, I think, I always think about the nutrition tool is sharpest at the beginning and gets dull over time. For bariatric surgery, it just stays super sharp and it stays sharp for longer, but it will start to get dull um, at some point. So it just expands it out. So I think of it the same way with just an expanded out period of weight loss because that negative energy balance is kind of being forced into the physiology with the anatomy change. That was a terrific question. So thank you to... Um whomever asked that question, terrific question. And I love that analogy of like the sharpness that then it's kind of like a knife that then it dulls. And so I think that's, that's a great analogy. So and the perfect I diet. Patients, Beth, I love, I do that because it's a hard concept for them. They always think they can lose weight forever. And I'm like, no, no, no. The knife is going to get dull. Take advantage of this first. Don't waste it. Let's lose as much as we can because we're going to need to move to weight loss maintenance at some point. So it's actually something I talk about with my patients because they can get that. So I think it's a counseling, kind of a counseling strategy or counseling tool that can be helpful. Well, it sounds like, and it can be very motivating to say, take advantage of this time period, but it also explains that plateau. I mean, I get that question all the time from people and I don't know what to say when they say I've plateaued and I can't get past this. And again, I'm always, 
I always worry so much about the emotional and psychological effects of this on people, the struggle that people have. And so I really like this where you're really motivating people in that four to six months and say, work really hard, and then we're going to switch gears and do something a little bit different. Yeah. And then I say we may then go into weight loss eventually. So I talk about losing weight, maintaining, losing and then going weight, back in. Yeah. No one wants to say, no one ever wants to say, you know, they're never finished with weight loss. Yeah. Everybody wants to lose five more pounds, 10 more pounds, right. whatever. So you don't want to take that away from them because that's motivating. That's why they're there. They want to lose a certain amount of weight and, and they may need to based on their, their situation you know, their, their health situation. And so, but we want to do it in a way that can be more effective and so that right. they can keep it off long, you know, they can keep it off instead of regaining it. But I think that's very affirming when they're experiencing that plateau, that it's not something they're doing wrong necessarily, that this is natural. And I think that, again, I think I find that kind of affirming. So, yeah. you know, I, so that they don't feel like, the problems with them. You oh, know. yeah, so, absolutely. I always talk about physiology, guys. It, 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 that doesn't mean we can't make a change, but definitely your physiology and your metabolism play a role. And it's not just about willpower. It's about way yeah. more than just willpower. Yeah, because it's so natural to, for people to blame themselves. What am I doing wrong? I think exactly. that's really so typical. So let's talk about this again, low fat versus low carb. Is one better than the other or... So there's something else at play here. So I studied this for a very long time. I was obsessed with a low carb diet. I was on a low carb diet for probably all my medical school years. I went around eating hard boiled eggs on rounds, um, was sure this was the solution. Um, and then actually ended up studying it, which was beautiful, right? I got to actually, I had one of the, was involved in one of the first big NIH grants to look at low carbohydrate diets. And what kind of has come of this guys is, when you really can adhere to a diet, it doesn't really matter the macronutrient composition. And it may be different for different people. There isn't probably going to be one best diet. And we need to get away from that because I think now we're kind of spinning our wheels, trying to prove that one diet is the diet. There's probably multiple or there are multiple diets that will work. We need to get better at matching. That's where we need to spend some time. How can we individualize and figure out what person is going to do best on what diet? But we need to get kind of step away from that is low fat better than low carb or vice versa. We have plenty of data that show both of them work and they work in different people and, you know, different people in different amounts, but both of them work. Well, that's, that's great news because I get really frustrated with that, <laughs> with that topic all the time. And you've got people that are just so entrenched in either camp and you just, it's kind of nice to know that you know, adherence is what really matters. And, and, and so I think that's a, that's a, a, a great message. And I think as, as, you know, as, um, you know, practitioners, we need to know, understand that, that someone comes in, if something's worked, they're going to feel like that has to be the thing. But this slide really shows that adherence, different people adhere to diets differently. So if you look at the four diets that are represented on this on this graphic, you can see Atkins, Zone, Weight Watchers, and Ornish. You can see there are people who lost weight on all the diets, and there's people who gained weight on all the diets. And so the average weight loss was modest because I just gave them a book, um, but it was very similar. If you go over on this next half and you look at adherence, it's the people that adhered to the diet they were randomized to, the ones that could adhere to it, lost the most weight. So it's really a different, you know, and if, especially if you're a practitioner and one diet has worked for you, I think you tend to want to push that diet for everybody. And I think it's backing off and saying, okay, that one worked for me and it's a possible solution for others, but I shouldn't be so close-minded as to that's the only way that people can lose weight. Right. And some researchers and practitioners, if they've had a weight loss experience, they tend to then project that onto other people as well. And we have to really honor, you know, patient autonomy. And I think the interesting thing about this is that you see some, uh, so many analyses that are intention to treat. And that's, that's good. That's really important that we look at intention to treat analyses. But sometimes what that misses is this idea of the people who stuck to it. What yeah. did they have? Like in all comers and studying them, that's how we've been kind of taught all comers and randomization. 
but we really now to need to get more into this precision nutrition concept. Right. And that's a different way of designing a trial. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's really important to, to look at that. So we've talked about, um, you know, diet drives weight loss. So what about exercise and what about the differences between what we do during weight loss and what we do for weight maintenance? Yeah. So now let's look at weight loss maintenance on this slide. Let's look at 18 months, right? So that's a year out. Now it looks like that it's shifted. And actually, well, who's driving the bus in weight loss maintenance is physical activity. Physical activity is driving the bus, meaning it becomes more important. Nutrition was the most important thing for weight loss. But now if you look at the difference between the green bars at 18 months, you can see diet and then diet plus exercise. The ones who keep the weight off are the ones that had the exercise added. And you can see it in both different you know, diet conditions. So there's a big difference between those bars. So really over time, nutrition is playing a big role at the beginning. And then over time, as we move into weight loss maintenance, physical activity starts to play a bigger role. And by the end, I would say it's the number one predictor of success, success being who doesn't regain the weight. Yes. And that is, this is something that I really want to talk about because a lot of people may be familiar with this, but some people may not. Early on in my career, I worked with Delia Smith, who uh, was involved in the National Weight Control Registry. This has been around for a long time. Uh, our own chair of our department, Jim Hill, and then Rena Wing, um, they, they started this. Can you tell us about this? I've I've kind of paid attention to this for years simply because I worked with, with, with Delia, but I don't think everybody's familiar with this and it's really neat. I love yeah. it. So I kind of cut my teeth, my research teeth on the National Weight Control Registry. I was very fortunate that I um, was, you know, kind of came into Jim Hill's lab when this was just starting. So I got to do a lot of research in this group. And so this is a group of people that we've now followed for many, many years. Um, that have been successful, not just at losing weight, but at keeping it off. This was really a registry to say not just who, you know, who lost the weight or how did they lose the weight, although that could have been something that was found. It was more important, how do they keep it off? So to be in the registry, you have to have lost 30 pounds is the minimum. And that was random. That was just chosen. <laughs> you know that Jim, Jim and Rena were having a beer in a bar after a meeting and came up with it. Seriously. Let's do 30 pounds. <laughs> 30 pounds. Sounds like a good number to me. And let's say that you have to have kept it off for a year. Once again, random, but that's what so, they So you kept the weight off for a year. We want to know about you. Yeah. And so they started and they believed that they could learn from the successes instead of learning from the failures. And that's what the literature pretty much had done. Let's study the people who failed, meaning regain the weight. And Jim, you know, Jim, positive, right? Let's study from the people who are doing it. Let's study from the successes and started this National Weight Control Registry that has been hugely popular and so many papers and grants have really come out of it. And so there's some characteristics. What came out of it wasn't one way to lose weight, surprise, surprise, but some characteristics of what to do to keep it off. That's what really came out of this um, National Weight Control Registry. And some of these common characteristics that you see here are what came out of this data set. And before I go over a few of them, I just want to let everybody know that we now are, Jim and UAB is very heavily involved in something called the International Weight Control yeah. Registry. It's the next step. We're going to take this on an international level, and we're going to expand it not to just people who are successful at losing weight and keeping off, but even all comers. So we're really going to study this in a big data fashion and kind of the, we're calling it a citizen um, scientist partnership. We want to hear from people and learn what's working from what people are doing out there in the real world and that not is so to prescribe it. So, and, and I do want to point out, this is an observational study, so we can't say necessarily cause and effect, but these are associations between these behaviors and successful weight loss maintenance. But what we do, these are associations, but it really allows us to form some hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. So from this, then you can design a trial to look in a different way. So it allows you to get some data to, to think about what might be important, and then you can prove it in a more of a randomized control type fashion. So yes, this is a simply an association, but it can really lead to where we're going to go. 
So some common characteristics in the National Weight Control Registry, they do eat breakfast. I know that's controversial for a lot of people, but if I was betting on people in Vegas, almost 80% of the people who keep their weight off say they eat breakfast at least five days a week. So I don't know. I don't know. We, we, there's some controversy, but it seems like it's a, right. it's a characteristic that seems to be there. The one thing that really holds this group together and is then other research studies support the same thing is that high levels of physical activity are needed. 90% of them are reporting doing about an hour every single day. Um, a lot more than just what's needed for um, cardiovascular health. The amount um, of activity that's needed for prevention of weight regain is probably a larger volume. Creating that matching situation is probably part of what's going on, but that's one thing that they all held in common. They didn't necessarily lose weight the same way, but when the ones that were maintaining all had high levels of physical activity, they reported a, high, a lower fat intake. Now, I know there's a lot of RDs on this. Do you think it was really 24%? No, they, they, that's, that's underreported. It's, that's not the right number, but I do think they were trying to eat low fat. You know, we're not going to hang our hat on that number because we know there's issues with that. Um, they all report, or a big portion of them reported self-monitoring. They do, they did log their food mm -hmm. and weigh themselves. I know that's controversial. Should we be getting on the scale? This group gets on the scale. They don't get power to the scale but they use it as a data point. They use it as a self-monitoring tool. Um, they did consume low or no calorie sweeteners. We've asked specific questions about that. That's been controversial out there. They do use them and are successful at maintaining weight loss. Um, I, oh, here's the self-monitoring of weight, 75% at least once right. a week. And they don't, they report not watching a lot of TV. Now, are those numbers exactly right? No, I'm sure that we don't have the most accurate numbers, but I do think they limit their TV watching to some degree. Yeah, so that's that's really exciting. Now, what about you've got you're talking about metabolism here and before we get to some other stuff, can you because I want to talk about some things with mindset and your SOS program, but but quickly we still hear and, and I've been an R, I've been an RD for a long time and a typical belief that some people have is that it's my metabolism. I can't lose weight. I can't keep it off because when, you know, dieting has wrecked my metabolism, I just don't burn that many calories. Yeah, this is the question I started answering when my very, one of my very, very first research studies revolved around resting metabolic rate and kind of this question. And it's, it's a hard question because in many ways, if your metabolism isn't broken, but it is efficient. And there are some things that, it, and so in ways it is, it's different. So it's yes and no. It's one of those yes and no questions. Um, but it's one of the things that we think a lot about when we're designing interventions, because it's probably playing a big role. What's happening to your energy expenditure? What's happening to your metabolism? So this slide shows what normally happens. This is an abnormal behavior. This is a normal thing to happen. And as you lose weight, you create what's called an energy gap. And this happens for two reasons. It's because your resting metabolic rate goes down because when you lose weight, you have um, a lower body weight and that also decreases your lean mass. We don't lose 100% fat. We lose some muscle and some fat. And for both of those reasons, our resting metabolic goes down. That's normal. That's what's expected. In addition, our activity, and this is represented by the steps, the yellow steps, now you're smaller. You know, you started out at 180 pounds. Now you're at 150 pounds. You walk the exact same amount. You burn less calories because you're not moving 180 pounds. You're, burning, you're only moving 150. So that energy of expenditure gets smaller. And so this energy gap is created. And it's one of the reasons you plateau. And, but it's normal. It's not abnormal. It's right. So this is, not a, this is not a faulty metabolism. You have less work your body has less work to do it's carrying around less weight so this is expected this is normal it's not a faulty metabolism yeah so you know it's, it's, it's yes your energy expenditure goes down but in this case it's normal right it's what you would expect for the reduction in the weight one of the things we think is critical though is how you fill that gap how you feel that energy gap and and i will just point out at this point that for some people, there's the normal, and then there probably is a little bit more. We do have some efficiencies that develop over time, which is probably okay. another reason why that weight loss stops. 
So it probably is a little bit more efficient too. So the gap is a little bit bigger than you would expect. So it's both of those things. But then when we come to treatment now, or we come to intervention, how you fill that gap we think is critical for long-term success. And in this slide, you can see there's two ways to fill the gap or make up for the gap. And one is to eat less forever, to food restrict. You were eating a certain amount, now that you're smaller and your energy expenditure has gone down, you gotta eat to match it. You gotta eat less forever. We don't think that is probably as successful as if you fill the gap or at least part of the gap, or maybe we don't know exactly how much, but a majority of the gap by moving more, by physical activity. And that would support the data, right? That people who move more, who put that physical activity, that hour a day seem to do better. So it kind of goes with some of the data that we have out there that filling this gap with activity may lead us to success, be associated with success. Um, more than if you just try to do it with food restriction alone. Now, I know I'm talking to a lot of dietitians, so I've got to, I got to, I got to kind of talk about that. That doesn't mean we don't try to restrict food a little bit. We, we can do some things, right? We don't need empty calories or some quick things we can do that we can fill part of that gap with nutrition or easy things we can do. But to think that we're going to do it all with nutrition or even the majority of it with nutrition probably is not associated with you know, increasing the odds of long-term success. So you've got to kind of say, okay, nutrition is still important, but I've also got to address physical activity. Even as a new at, at RD, I've got to be able to address and counsel clients and patients with what they need to do in terms of physical activity. And this slide just, um, let me build it a little bit more. Hammers home why kind of the idea that we've now moved into an environment where energy expenditure is so low that we really have to think about matching. Our body can't match. We've moved down to such a low level of energy expenditure because of our environment that there's almost impossible for us to eat constantly that low. And the environment also does things to make us eat extra calories. But if we increase our energy expenditure, then we can move up here to this physiological control where our body can do it more. We don't have to do it as much with our head cognitively, like fighting it, fighting it, fighting it. Our body can step in and perhaps do some matching, help us instead of us having to do it all ourselves. So that's one of the reasons why we think physical activity may play such an important role in long-term weight loss uh, success. I also think it's a much more positive message you yeah. know, instead of eat less, eat less, eat less, it's like something that's a more positive message, move more. And there are so many different ways that people can move more that are social and fun and it doesn't have to be going to the gym. And I just think that message is a more important, is, is a more positive message. And that brings me to, you know, this slide, we've talked about, you know, the whys and the physiology and all of the research, but you're really, and this is one of the things I love about your programs and what you talk about, you are really big on mindset and the what and the how and looking at that psychological, emotional aspect of all of this. So let's, yeah. let's talk about that. So I always say I spent half my career saying, I'm going to figure out what people need to do. I'm going to study the National Weight Control Registry. I'm going to study all this you know, research and I'm going to figure out the perfect program or multiple programs. I'm going to get them to people and it's going to move the needle and it's going to be wonderful. Not so much because what to do while it's important, I always say we want an evidence-based what, don't go out there and give me the dang cookie diet or exercise while I sleep plan. We're not gonna do that. We need evidence-based what to do. That alone is not enough. I wish simply knowledge transfer, telling someone that yes, you need to eat veggies and here's how you can cook. And I wish that alone would move the needle. And in my experience, it doesn't. It needs to be there, but it's got to be coupled with why will they do it? It has to be coupled with mindset and motivation, making this bigger than just weight loss. This isn't easy. The behavioral change isn't easy. And that motivational piece, why will they do it? Especially when it gets tough, when it gets hard, has to be in there, in your program, or you will not have very much success or very much long-term success. Sometimes you will because someone will motivate themselves or they'll figure it out themselves. But if you're helping them with this piece, if you're working on the why, then you can help more of your clients, patients be successful. 
Yeah, and I, I just think that's such an important part of your programs and it's such an important part of motivation. And so um, talk a little bit more about this, about how you incorporate this into your programs. I do want you to tell everybody about your State of Slim program and, and again, also take more questions from the audience as, as they arise. Yeah, so I won't spend too much on this, but y'all, if anybody's hanging around me, you know that I believe the body follows the mind. I believe that we've got to work on our mindset just as much as we've got to work on, our, our, on changing our body, that they go hand in hand, that if we're going to be changing our body permanently, that we need to change our mindset permanently. And as a scientist, I always say, if I see it, I will believe it. And that's true. Give me the data. I want the data. I believe I'm, you know, I've got that scientific left-sided brain going strong. Um, but I also believe that if I believe it, that there's something about having that right mindset to be concentrating on that you can succeed and, and, and what you are going to do, not what you can't do, that you will see the result, that it goes both directions, that mindset is important. And that is something that we can't measure and we don't feel comfortable sometimes talking about, but it is just as important as some of the other pieces that we talk about. And I think all of us as dietitians know that because we've seen it, right? So, so this is really real, I think, for us, for those of us that are counselors. And Tara is, it has, has a question from the audience that um, I'd like to have her tell us about. Yes, just a quick question for you, Dr. Holly. So um, what do you recommend for people like men who participate in these very intense exercise programs, something like a CrossFit program? but they still can't seem to get rid of a thick layer of fat around their midsection. So that's perfect. That's a great question because what are they wanting? So they got the exercise going. This is not uncommon. They got the exercise going and they come in and they say, but I can't lose weight. I've still got fat because they haven't dialed in the nutrition because the nutrition is doing the heavy lifting to get the fat off. The physical activity is doing the heavy lifting to keep the fat from coming back. So they're going to have to tighten their nutrition. They're going to have to have a structured eating plan. They are obviously not in a negative energy balance for very long, at least. And that's why they have. So it's perfect setup, right? They have just moved to the weight loss. Maintenance. They're doing great at weight loss maintenance. They just don't have the weight loss piece. They need to go back and dial in the nutrition. They might also have some unrealistic expectations of having a six pack. <laughs> True. I mean, yes, we could talk about waist circumference. What really right. <laughs> Um, one of my friends who is a, is a physical therapist at, at UAB, he always says, I have, and he's fit, but he says, I have a six pack. There's just a layer of fat over it. And, you know, and so, you know, we don't really always have control as to exactly where we get rid of that fat. Very, very true. But I've seen CrossFitters who do have significant fat and it's because they haven't dialed in the nutrition. Yeah. So again, it just goes back to that, that message of, weight loss and fat loss is diet related maintenance. We got to do the exercise alone. Is not going to do it for that? So it's, it's a great way to, to get that message home. I love this about intention because, you know, my PhD is in behavioral medicine and this is the theory of planned behavior right here that centers on intentions and how your intentions can really predict behavioral outcomes. Yeah. So this is one of my favorite things. I teach this all the time. And finally, when sometimes I see a light bulb go on, it, this is one of my big kind of aha moments for people sometimes. But I always have this in any program, I'm teaching this. This is how we normally go about achieving a goal. In January, perfect time. This is what everybody's done. They do something. Oh, let me. They do something. They go on a diet, right? Or they restrict their calories. They go to the gym. They do take some action to have something, which this middle picture is weight loss. That's why they're doing it. I'm going to eat less so I can lose weight. So I can be happy, confident, strong, whatever is their real why they want to lose weight. There's something tied to weight loss that they want to achieve. If there wasn't, then they wouldn't lose weight. It's really not just about the weight loss. It's really how they want to feel or live or be or experience life that's tied to the weight loss. That's the true motivation. But this is what we do. We do something, we go on a diet, to have weight loss, to be whatever it is that you want to be strong, happy, confident you know, um, engaging in life fully, not settling, all those kinds of things. That's the typical way we do it. But we're going to flip it on its head because the B part, how you want to be is actually the most important thing. So one of the things we do in State of Slim and in all the programs that I develop is we be first. In other words, we decide that we're going to be happy 
are strong or whatever's important. We're going to be it now. We're not going to wait for 50 pounds. We're going to actually do that now because it affects what you do. So if you're happy or strong or confident and you go into that workout and you say, I am strong, I am an athlete. I feel strong. Do you think it affects how that out, that, how you, uh, how you tackle that, that action, that, that workout? Absolutely. And it influences everyone around you, which ultimately gives you the goal of weight loss or fitness or whatever it is. But we just flip flop them. We start with the intention, which impacts what we do, which is the action, which ultimately I believe impacts the outcome better, stronger. We get there quicker, easier. And so then we flip flop things. And that's one of the big mindset shifts that we incorporate in the program. And, you know, I think again, as dietitians, I know I've seen this a lot when I did used to work in weight loss programs. I always give this example. I'll never forget having a, a participant in a weight loss program come in. And I said, hey, how are you? And she said, I'll let you know after I get on the scale. So how she felt, her mood, how she felt about herself, her day, was dependent on whether or not she had lost weight. And I remember just not knowing as a dietitian how to, knowing that was not good <laughs> and that that was not gonna be a positive, helpful way for her to lose weight. But you know, it's like, wh what do you do? You know, how do you, how do you help people to change that? Well, it starts with awareness. I always say you just gave your power to the scale mm -hmm. and I need you to keep your power. You're not a, a great way to put scale. it. You, you know, and you just gave your power to the scale. I need that data point. You need that data point. Just like we need blood glucoses on people who have diabetes. We're battling your weight. We're fighting your weight together. I need to know that number. You need to know that number, but we do not need to give any power to it. And that's usually kind of how I start. And it's, I, I it's, love that. Don't about, give your power away. Don't yeah, give your power away. That, right over time um, and relearning that, yeah. that, that thing, relearning it. I really love that. I wish I had talked to you way back when I was a young dietitian and didn't know how to, you know, I, you, know you, you know, this isn't good, but what do you say, right? Because we don't really learn that often as young dietitians, at least I didn't. Maybe now things are different. It's, 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 it's a lot. Well, what I don't different. like is when people throw out the scale. I'm a firm believer in weighing. In the registry, they yeah. weigh. I believe I need that number and I am not about not weighing. And that can be the battle I have to do. But right. Part of me is how, like, okay, how, how do we handle that? Dr. Holly, we have just a few minutes left and I really want to get to any more questions that we have from the audience, but also I want you to tell us a little bit about State of Slim. Yeah, let me let me get to State of Slim. So State of Slim is where a lot of these concepts can come together. Um, it is a book that I've authored, but also a program. We're going to be start doing more and more, hopefully at UAB, along with other programs. There's no one program. We need multiple programs. Um, to have kind of fit, it really fits with what I call transformative weight loss, which is making it bigger than just about the weight. There's a big mindset piece to it, um, but there's also evidence-based what to do. And um, it's about beginning with the end in mind. I always say this program was reverse engineered, mm -hmm. kind of took where you need to be from a weight standpoint, a mindset standpoint, or where your metabolism needs to be, where your nutrition needs to be, your environment needs to be, where your your purpose needs to be in your identity and backed it up. So while you're losing the weight, you're also getting ready for weight loss maintenance because point B is where you need to go into weight loss maintenance. You're going to lose weight from A to B, but when you get to B, I want you to be ready, right? To go into weight loss maintenance. So the program was really designed as a transformation to get you where you need to be to keep um, the weight off. So, and the last point is it's got to be bigger than weight loss. I know, I wish I could say that weight loss alone is enough of a motivator, but I have not found that to be. Being healthy is not a motivator for most people long-term. We've got to tie in something else that's super important to them. We've got to tie, them in, tie it into this new lifestyle. And when you learn how to do that, when this new way of living is hooked to your purpose or your self-identity or your core values or things that are just super important to you, that's when it sticks. That's when the people are successful long term. So that's the last point. But to me, it's the most important one is making this much, much bigger than just losing 20 pounds or 30 pounds. Yeah. And I, I, I think drilling down with people on what are their values? What are their beliefs? What are their values? 
is, is so critical. And that is a part of um, some new programs that are not necessarily new, but Acceptance Commitment Therapy Act, what is called ACT, is really looks at that as well. So I think hopefully we're seeing a shift in that in um, our counseling styles and just, and just a lot of things that we do. Tell us how, I'm, I'm gonna put in, if you are interested in actually seeing some people that have been in Dr. Holly's program, uh, I was very fortunate to get to interview some of them and make a video about it. Um, so this is not just a shameless plug for my YouTube page, but if you go to Beth Kitchen PhD RDN on my YouTube, on YouTube, go to there and go there on YouTube, you will see three amazing people that um, shared their experiences on the state of SLIM. Uh, it was actually the state of SLIM research study and their stories are really compelling and very touching. And I think it really speaks to, to them and also to the quality of the program. But Dr. Holly, tell us about where people can follow you. Yeah, so um, there I've just put up here my email address. I love to get email. So if you have a question, you can always send me an email. I do have a Facebook page and an Instagram page, also some a State of Slim Facebook page too. But um, yeah, that, these are the ways to get a hold of me. And this, is, this has been a lot of fun. Do we have any more questions? Um, we do. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, Tara, sh shoot us some questions here. So we have a question from someone that relates to what you were talking about with plateauing. So this is one of the dietitians on the call, and she says that um, she works with a lot of women who've been through menopause, and they say it's much harder for them to lose weight at that point. Do you have any advice for those who work out, they're following a strict calorie plan, and they're still not seeing any weight loss? Yeah, so, you know, the data here is a little bit hard. I mean, definitely body shape changes, where mm -hmm. you store fat changes. So there's a lot of changing going on in menopause. There's no doubt about that. You know, is it truly more difficult to lose weight or not? That's not as clear, really, if you look at the data. But I do think it is a time when people um, tend to struggle. You know, I always say, you know, if someone has truly plateaued, meaning they can't lose weight, um, they've lost weight and they're plateaued, or maybe they just can't lose weight at all. I like to think about two, there's two different, I put them in two different camps. One of them is they truly are adhering and it's not moving or they're struggling with adhering, which is, which is real too, right? I mean, they're both of them. And to me, what you do differs a little bit. If one of them is that they're struggling with adhering to the diet, then it's about motivation and trying to kind of change the mindset and the motivation and being, you know, looking at it from that direction versus, oh my gosh, they really are adhering to the recommendations and you feel pretty confident about that but the scale isn't moving, then it is more, maybe a bit more physiological. And then I actually have some tips and tricks that I try to pull out to resharpen the tools. Um, my second book that I'm writing is, the first book was about beating the yo-yo, which is state of slim. The second book is about beating the plateau and how do you keep weight loss going by trying to resharpen some of those tools. And I'll just give you a little bit of a hint, timed eating or um, you know, timed eating might be a tool that might be used. I don't think it's a great tool for weight loss. I think it's a great tool for sharpening the tool to get some additional weight loss, hmm. even for weight loss maintenance, but that more to come. I haven't, I, that's, that's kind of, I gave you away a little bit of my secret that's coming out, um, for my next book. But the idea then, as I think of them in two ways, they're hard, you know, you got to say, is it, is it motivation or is it physiology? And that can be hard to figure out. Great question. That's a great question. Other questions, anybody else? Yeah, if there's any other questions, you can either type them in the chat or since we're at the end of the yeah. segment, if you want to unmute yourself, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Thanks, Tara. Dr. Holly, thank you so much. I, I, I love just everything that we've talked about today. I think it's so useful. We'd love to have you back later in the year. So uh, for anyone who is watching, if there are other things that you'd like to have Dr. Holly talk about, she's got a lot more <laughs> going on and a lot more that she can offer us. So, um, so, so we would love to have her back on for another episode of RD Updates. If there are no other questions, again, thank you as always. I'm gonna turn it back over to Tara to talk about what next month's RD Updates will be. And then also to let you know what you need to do to get your CPEs. Yes, thank you, Beth. And thank you so much, Dr. Holly. This was such a great 
session. I, I really love hearing you speak about your passions and your career. And I echo what Beth said that I wish I had known you when I was doing weight loss counseling myself, because I can just think back to all these people that I worked with. And I'm like, I knew their why, but we didn't focus on their why at the beginning. And that's what we should have done. So I just, I love hearing this from you. And who knows, maybe we'll get to use it at some point in my career still. <laughs> <laughs> So for our um, CPEUs, just for any of the registered dietitians that are uh, still on the line, I have been putting the uh, survey link that you have to complete in the chat box. Please do fill that out because it'll give us feedback about the session. And then it also gives me your contact information for where to send your certificate. And I'll send those out within the next day or so. And then coming in February, on Monday, February 22nd, we're going to have one of our registered dietitian alums of the department, Jennifer Thompson, talking to us about her private practice and what it's like to set up a private practice business. And then also some specifics about billing and coding for insurance purposes in the private practice world. So I know this has been a, a popular request from a lot of people. So I hope those of you interested in this realm uh, are able to join us. And if there's no other questions, uh, we'll hang on for just a couple minutes. But if there's no other questions, we'll see you all next time. And thanks so much for joining us today.